So in 2002, Aaron, who was completely healthy, went in for an outpatient hemorrhoidectomy, and they sent her home. And at that time, she had chills and fever, a rapid heartbeat. I gave her some pain medication and said it was just a, a consequence of the surgery. The doctor showed up, and he was actually 12 hours late to see her, they said she had sepsis. Sepsis is the body's response to an infection or an injury. And it starts as an immune response that spins out of control. And now the organs, kidneys, lung, heart, liver, and brain, and other organs become damaged. These complications can be transient, short-lived, or they can become permanent and cause death. Aaron passed away from sepsis, and I had never heard the word sepsis. Unfortunately, the five doctors who were treating her seemingly didn't know much about it either. And the morning that she passed away, I was told there were lots of errands. I had no idea the amount of people dying. The death rate, the mortality from sepsis is a staggering problem. Across the world, tens of millions of people die from severe sepsis every year. And within the United States, some 200,000 people or so die of severe sepsis annually. Rory had fallen playing basketball in school so he had cut his elbow just a, a little scrape. We took his temperature and it was very high. It was um, 104. So we decided to call the doctor and by the time we were bringing him in, he uh, he gotten a lot weaker. From the time of the early signs of infection or injury to the time of organ failure and death can be as short as 12 to 24 hours. They did his tests and they took his blood and they came back and they said uh, he was being released and uh, that was it. We had absolutely no idea how sick he was at that point. There's a window of opportunity in which the early recognition that sepsis might be occurring or might occur can be prevented by administration of fluids, by administration of antibiotics, and by timely administration of oxygen. His nose began to turn black, and we went right back into the hospital with him, into the emergency room. Doctors just started coming from everywhere, and no one would look at me. Then he said his feet were cold. He said, Mom, my toes are cold, my toes are cold. He um, never spoke again. Never spoke again. Never. If you die of an infection, you die of sepsis. So if you die of pneumonia, the flu, a cut on your leg, anything like that, and it's infected, you die of sepsis. They've taken his blood, they've taken the vitals, and now we find out that he had every one of the symptoms for sepsis. I'd never heard of the word beforehand. We didn't hear it in the hospital. We didn't hear it from the doctors. We never heard anyone use that word. No, never. So we've now learned that sepsis is the most common cause of death in most hospitals. So it would seem to me, if physicians want to save lives and monies for their hospital, they should think sepsis first and rule sepsis out. Why are people not ruling out sepsis first? Why is uh, why has it not happened? I have no clue. I have no clue. All I know is our son died, and all I know is he passed through many hands that night, and not one person said, could this be sepsis? Not one person. Before he died, um, we made contact with Michael Downey, who is the, the Chief Executive Officer of North Shore LIJ. I met the Stauntons soon after their son Rory passed away. Uh, they were introduced to me by a mutual friend. And he put together a group of his doctors to speak to us about sepsis. Every healthcare facility, uh, you know, that wants to be focused on quality is always concerned about uh, mortality. Uh, and the bulk of mortality generally comes from infection. And so uh, I declared the policy quite a number of years ago that it wasn't good enough to have an X percentage of infection, it had to be zero. So it is really represents a culture change at every level of the organization that this disorder is recognized and treated aggressively as a life-threatening condition, even when the initial appearance may not be life-threatening. And we left those meetings feeling that we had been dealing with the gold standard in sepsis care because there is awareness throughout the health system on sepsis. For this to work, it requires universal awareness because the delivery of health care and the improvement of processes like this involve the administrators, the nurses, the doctors, the emergency medicine people, the whole constellation of individuals 
that have anything to do with the patient. The most exciting piece of this is that we have reduced the mortality rate for all patients in the health system presenting with sepsis by 50%. They cut sepsis fatalities by 50% over five years. So then we said, well, why can't that be done nationally? So we went to Congress and we had the first ever hearing, the Senate Health Committee on Health had hearings on sepsis. And then, of course, uh, they decided uh, that they wanted to, in many ways, you could say, lead a crusade so that it wouldn't be repeated, uh, what happened to their son. At every angle we've gone to, we've had to force the door open. We've had to push it open. But yet then we find out that Carl Flatley went to all of those buildings 10 years ago. When I started this in 2002, I went to the CDC, I went to NIH, I went to Congress to find out who was keeping track of this, and no one was. Why is it left up to two people who've had to be tortured and to bury their son to take on a campaign? Shouldn't government be doing this? And their government agencies out there protecting Americans? And my point is, well, what have they done since Aaron Flatley died? The biggest problem we have is no one's ever heard of sepsis. I mean, 60% of Americans have never heard the word sepsis. So the public does not put pressure on Congress or the CDC to help them. So here we are 10, 12 years later, we've got millions of people that have died that shouldn't have. It's crucial that standard medical therapies for severe sepsis be adopted at hospitals across the country and across the world to save lives. If we just gave them antibiotics and fluids, we could save at least half of those lives. It's just a matter of early recognition and rapid treatment. And it also requires the commitment and the priority by government. Government has to say this is important. The CDC has to say this is what we are going to support and provide advice to. We are on board fully on this. This has to come from the top down. It shouldn't be coming from the suffering parents of. Nor your LIJ should be the national template cutting fatalities by 50% from sepsis. I look forward to the day when we can quote that statistic nationally, but I hope we don't have to wait another 10 years. Rory was a big, blonde-haired kid, big blondie, but when he died, he was almost purple from head to toe. You couldn't recognize him. Rory Staunton's death was preventable and the thousands that come after them are preventable. Words cannot express how much you miss a child, especially when you know it was preventable. And sepsis is preventable. Thank you very much, and one of the extraordinary moments that I've had in the last two years since Rory's death is when Karen and Orla get letters from parents, uh, recently one from Florida, of a mother who went to the emergency room and demanded that the child be looked at for sepsis, and they subsequently discovered that the child had sepsis. And I think there's been about 12 or 15 kids around the country that parents have written to Karen and Orla, and I'm sure Carl has got letters too saying thank you for saving my child. And can there be anything more precious than saving a child or indeed an adult from sepsis? A big part of it is the media coverage that we have got, and I'd like to pay particular tribute, although he'll hate me for saying it, but the Pulitzer Prize winning writer Jim Dwyer's article on the front page of the New York Times was what galvanized so much support behind Kieran and Orla when they began the Staunton Foundation. And Jim is with us here today. Jim, thank you so much for everything. <laughs> I'd also like to thank CBS Evening News is here and the Irish Times and Irish Television RTE are also here. The media is a very important part of the story. As a member of the media, I can absolutely confirm that until Rory's story appeared on, in the Times, it was going to be very hard to get the kind of leverage that Kieran and Orla subsequently did. Which brings us to our next guest, who is the leading public official dealing with the issue of sepsis in the United States. Uh, we're very pleased that he took the time out of what is an incredibly busy schedule to be with us. Would you welcome, please, Thomas R. Frieden, MD, Director, Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. Dr. Frieden.
Thank you very much. And I, I really want to thank and uh, salute uh, uh, the Stauntons, uh, Kieran and Orle, as well as all of the other families that have uh, been bringing this to the public eye. Uh, and also thank Senator Schumer and Congressman Crowley uh, for uh, their leadership on this issue. We have a lot more to do. And uh, I'm just here to say that at CDC we will do whatever we can uh, and to encourage you to keep pushing as you're doing. Because uh, we would all like to think that government will work well uh, and health care would work well because we're all well-meaning. Uh, but it often doesn't unless people push from inside the system, from below, from above, from inside, from outside. So I encourage you all to keep doing what you're doing. And thank you for doing that. Um, <clears throat> exactly 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago, uh, I walked into my home and our four-month-old child, baby, was in my wife's arms. And the moment I opened the door, I thought he was dead. Um, he was septic with uh, pneumococcal pneumonia. And um, Senator. Uh, and he was uh, near death, actually. Um, my wife was paralyzed with fear. Um, as an infectious disease physician, I knew something was wrong. And we immediately got him tested, treated, and he is alive and well. And every single individual with sepsis should have that outcome now. Um, so your efforts are incredibly important. Um, <clears throat> as you know, sepsis is the final common pathway for many different diseases, pneumonia, urinary tract infection, many wounds, many other things. It's also uh, caused by many different organisms, different bacteria. All of them can lead to sepsis if not managed appropriately. There are fundamentally three chances that we have to prevent a death from sepsis. The first is to prevent it from happening in the first place. The second is to improve early recognition and care so that we can ensure that patients get treated rapidly. And the third, uh, if someone has become septic, is to optimally manage their care, uh, which is something that I did uh, for many, many patients as an infectious disease uh, clinician and uh, internal medicine doctor for many years. We need to do all three to try to get that number, as was said, to zero. CDC has done a lot. Um, all of us could do more. If you just think about vaccinations, the disease that I took a lot, of, spent a lot of my time caring for as a doctor, hemophilus sepsis, and that my son almost died from, pneumococcal sepsis, have almost disappeared with vaccinations. They used to be very common. Uh, not so very long ago. And that's present, prevented hundreds of thousands of cases of sepsis. Uh, our work with hospitals around the country and with uh, CMS, with which we have a real uh, productive partnership now, has resulted in a dramatic decrease in some healthcare associated infections. And that has saved tens of thousands of lives in the past decade. And you are absolutely right that we need to improve awareness in communities, in healthcare facilities. And we really salute your advocacy on this. Um, the Stauntons asked me to do a series of things uh, when I first met them nine months ago. I believe we've done them all, but they would have to say that. I'm sure they will have another list for us, and we'll be making lists for ourselves, and we will also commit to doing those and being held, held accountable for having done them, because there's much more that needs to happen. Uh, sepsis is not nearly widely known enough. Uh, I will say that we also um, we'll be doing a lot to better understand where we're going. It's not enough to mean well. It's not enough to uh, work hard. You have to also figure out if there's accountability. Uh, are the things that we hope work working? Are we really making progress? Are there populations or conditions or microbes for which they're working less well? How can we make more progress? If you don't have a monitoring system, if you don't have data for action, then you're driving blind, and we don't want to be doing that. We want to guide our interventions and for us collectively to hold ourselves accountable for more progress. That's why it's so critical to make sure that we have accurate measurements so that we can know how it's going and we can hold ourselves, healthcare facilities, and entire communities accountable. But we need to know how much sepsis there is, what the impact of policy change is, uh, whether 
uh, different facilities impacts are scalable, what they're doing right, what part of it works. Uh, and in that regard, we've been working very closely with CMS and we'll continue to partner with them because they have levers that can get those tools implemented very, very widely. Um, I, I do want to mention before I close just one, one issue which uh, sometimes comes up, uh, and that's the issue of whether there's any conflict between uh, the issue of antibiotic stewardship, which is very important, and sepsis. Because uh, from a, a first impression, you might think these two things are in conflict in some way. Well, because in sepsis we're saying give antibiotics when needed, and in stewardship we're saying be careful about the antibiotics you give. I think, in fact, they're not in conflict in any way. In fact, they're in synergy in very important ways. Uh, what we need is to ensure that antibiotics are used promptly whenever they are needed and not when they're not needed. It's a kind of simple concept, but that's both very important. And the way to get that done is by evidence-based protocols, protocols that we implement, assess, optimize, and use, uh, including triggers for starting antibiotics, triggers for evaluation of patients, clear checklists, and clear times to reassess whether antibiotics are needed, because sepsis can be caused not only by giving antibiotics too late, but by not giving them correctly. So I think we actually do share the same goal. Um, this issue of protocol is very important. And as we've looked at how we can get more health value for our health dollar, how we can save more lives, the issue of protocol-based care uh, raises to the top. It doesn't mean taking the judgment out of doctors. It means improving their ability to deliver services effectively. The other issue that rises to the top is involving the entire team. That means doctors, nurses, pharmacists, aides, people who work in healthcare facilities, families, communities, community organizations. All of us are necessary to make the kind of progress that we need to make and will be making uh, going forward with all of our work together. Now, we're committed to continuing our efforts to raise awareness of the prevent of sepsis. We're continuing, we're committed to continuing to do everything we can to prevent it wherever possible. We're committed to helping improve how we track sexis, sepsis so that we can improve the recognition and management and improve the outcomes of individuals who have sepsis. And we're committed to working with stakeholders at every level of society and government who are committed to making a difference. Sepsis is a tragedy. It's a tragedy that happens all too often. It's a tragedy that can be prevented. And while in, we can't change the past, we can certainly work together to change the future. And I commit to you that we at CDC will do everything within our power to do that with you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Faden. Just want to see if he survives getting by uh, Senator Schumer, but he's made it. <laughs> Just ask them to put more money in. Okay. And he's going to blame you. <laughs> senator Schumer, to, to many people out there, is just a United States senator. To their opponents, he's called worse. To us, he's a friend. And we used to say many years ago when Rory would run for politics, we'd start with Crowley and by then Schumer would be about 99 and maybe he might give up the seat, but he won't. <laughs> there is nothing we have achieved in the last 12 months since our son died that would, from a national point of view that could have been done without Senator Chuck Schumer's office, without Senator Chuck Schumer and his staff and Martin and Veronica and everyone. Every time we called his office, and every time we made a suggestion, there was someone there. And the morning after, the middle of the night when Rory died, I got a call, I picked up the call, didn't know who it was. It's Chuck Schumer on the end of the line saying, offering his sympathy and just remembering that he's always there. And his cell phone is there. It's always there. Thank you is too small a word for us to use for Chuck Schumer because you know, on the hill, and let me just tell you something, going forward, there'll be senators, I know you were in from Iowa yesterday, 
and your senator, you've met with Senator Grassley. Uh, senator Grassley and Chuck Schumer arm wrestle now and again, but they're not the best of friends. But let me assure you, they'll work together when it comes to the better. Yeah, we're both Charles D. You're both Charles D. I'd say that's probably the only thing you have in common. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, you lost your dad, we lost, so everyone knows that there's no party politics in it. Continuously, when we booked this event, Congress is only back for a few days, they insisted that half his morning was blocked to attend this event. I could go on, but you know what? There's no point. Everything that Orla and I and Neil in our community, he's been there for us. But going forward, when you're lining up and we're getting bills passed, and there will be bills passed, they'll be the man that'll be spearheading it. Anyway, Senator Chuck Schumer, our friend. Well, thank you to my dear friend Kieran, who I am committed, but I've done one one thousandth of what Kieran and Orla have done, and let's not forget that. So he was, as usual, so generous in spirit and in words, and most of all in action, as he has always been, because we've known each other long before Rory's tragedy. And he was a dynamo then, and one wonders when such a terrible and non-purposeful, why, why, why tragedy happens, does somebody lose their spirit and just sort of sit there and curse the darkness? Well, Kieran and Orla have not done that, praise God. And there are going to be people living who would have died because of their indomitable spirit and faith. So we thank them for that. Uh, and I'll have more to say about him and Orla in a minute. Uh, I, but I do want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, Patrick Conway, Dr. Shai was told was here. We just heard from Dr. Frieden, and I whispered to him on the way out, look at that chart. You've got to put more money in. But if he doesn't do it, we're going to do it. The Congress will force them to do it, uh, which I'll get to in a minute as well. Anyway, I, uh, this is such an impressive gathering, and I do want to say a word uh, to the other families who have suffered losses. And knowing Rory and Kieran and a few others who have passed away from sepsis so unnecessarily, um, I want to thank you all for being here. You see the pictures of the kids and adults on the wall. Um, you know, the normal reaction, as I mentioned, when something like this happens is to curse the darkness, is to basically fold up shop have your soul fold up shop and you sort of just go through life empty. And that's a reasonable human reaction. And the fact that you are all here, working with Kieran, Orla, and everybody else, shows that instead of cursing the darkness, you're lighting a candle. And if you read the scriptures, and you're a person of faith, and I imagine you are, even if you weren't before, faith is the only refuge when something like this happens, uh, you'll know that the scriptures tell us that to light a candle is one of the most saintly things you can do when great tragedy befalls you. And you are doing that, and we salute you for that, all of the families who are here. <laughs> now, first, a few numbers. You've heard them, but they're worth repeating. A million people in the United States develop sepsis every year. Four million Americans have been killed killed, some might say murdered, in the last decade through sepsis. It's a deadly disease. It's a costly disease. According to the U.S. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, we spend about $24 billion, that's billion with a B, each year on treating patients with sepsis, making it one of the most expensive causes of hospitalization in the country. And then, of course, Look at all the families who are impacted by loved one developing this devastating condition. And for too long, far too long, the only people beating the drum on such a terrible, terrible disease that is preventable have been you. That has to change, and that will change. It's already starting. Here, I mean, Kieran and Orla. Staunton are an example. At their insistent and inspirational prodding, 
New York has taken the lead, I'm proud to say, as we have in many other health issues. And last year passed Rory's regulations named after the beautiful boy you all saw earlier who tragically died of sepsis. I'll never forget those dark hours after he died and being on the phone with Corey, uh, uh, with uh, Star uh, Kieran. And um, again, the work they've done. I want to praise Dr. Shah. I want to praise the governor, Governor Cuomo. They were both courageous, bold, and decisive when prevent, presented with the challenge of what to do to confront sepsis. They didn't study the problem to death, as some have done. They took action to save lives. They promulgated Rory's regulations. Rory's regulations, simply put, require, and I'm sure you've heard some of this from Dr. Shah, uh, require health care providers in New York to develop and implement protocols to rapidly diagnose and treat sepsis infections. There's no two ways about it. This goes a long way to proving the rate which we catch sepsis in its early stages. And for those of you who are familiar with the condition, early detection is one of the most important factors in treating and curing the illness. Um, I, I imagine what happened earlier is you heard the story of Rory, how nobody caught it. <laughs> he was there at doctors. Nobody caught it. And I'm sure your experience has been somewhat similar, those of you who are families here. So early detection is key. Now, we're trying to do the same thing as New York has done at the federal level. My colleagues and I are working with stakeholders as well as our hosts here at the Rory Staunton Foundation to do our part in combating this serious illness. CMS has been engaged on this issue, as you've heard from Dr. Conway, and they're working on addressing the sepsis challenge. And they have two reasons, first and foremost, to save lives, but CMS is, you know, they're looking to save money everywhere. <laughs> this is one of the most logical places where they could save billions and billions and billions of dollars. When you hear some of the cuts they make, they make no sense, and yet, Here's where they could focus and easily save huge amounts of money. So CMS has been somewhat engaged. We're pushing them to be more engaged. But like New York, we need real action, clear across the board protocols, better methods of identifying and treating sepsis before it threatens lives. And I'll also be working with CMS to ensure they incorporate sepsis detection and reduction goals into their pay for performance programs, which will give them a dollar incentive, often they work by dollars, value-based purchasing, accountable care organizations, things like that. But on top of a clear national protocol modeled on New York's regulations, awareness, simple awareness is, a, is an important piece of the puzzle, and that's why today is such a breakthrough. Kieran and Orla have done amazing work on this front by telling this, their story to the world. It's, you don't have to be a genius to know that every time they tell the story, it's painful. They've exponentially increased awareness of the lurking dangers of sepsis. People used to shrug their shoulders. Well, this happens. Well, if you're one of the families that has suffered the unnecessary loss of a loved one, you can't say this happens. And We've now, the awareness of sepsis is greatly on the increase. Because of Kieran and Orla, their gift of apt activism and passion, there are probably people living today who wouldn't have been, just because of awareness, even in the states that haven't adopted the protocols. And it's an amazing thing. So we have to carry this message forward in a more coherent way. We all have to do our part. Today I'm announcing, I'm introducing a resolution to designate September as National Sepsis Awareness Month. Not just this September, but every September. And <laughs> it's my sincere hope that my colleagues will work with stakeholders in the administration to educate the public, to educate doctors, to educate hospitals and clinics about the early signs of sepsis so that no family has to experience the unfathomable loss of a loved one stolen from them too soon. So the next thing I want to do, and 
if you look at that chart, which I'm sure has been pointed out to before, we're going to be, if CDC won't do it on, our, on their own, we hope maybe they will, maybe awareness crept into Dr. Frieden's presentation today, um, we're going to push them on the Senate Appropriations Committee and require them to direct some of CDC's funding to go specifically to sepsis awareness, outreach, and education. We need real goals and deadlines and action to drive awareness and knowledge into every corner. So that's another thing we can do, and I promise you I will do everything I can to make sure that that happens. In closing, I want to commend the efforts of the Rory Staunton Foundation for your tireless efforts to the issue. As I said, I know it's personal for the Stauntons and for others. I can't imagine how hard it is. But I wholly believe that their efforts that brought us here today will end up saving not just a few lives, important as that would be, but tens of thousands, if not millions of lives over the years if we persist, and I know they will. So as I said, we're lighting a candle here today, particularly the families, particularly the Stauntons. But I want to tell you, when Kier Kieran and Orla are not just a candle, they're a laser beam of light. <laughs> and I know that for ye from years and years of friendship. And their foundation is a creator of this laser beam of light for this cause. It's time we take up their cause at the federal level. They've done their job at the state level. We have to help increase awareness of safe sepsis nationwide. We have to establish clear national standards for early identification and prompt treatment, and then and dedicate more resources, more focus, more energy, more dollars to the implementation of early det detection and treatment protocols, which will save, as I said, eventually millions of lives. So we'll continue pushing, and we'll continue working together in honor of that beautiful boy, Rory, who was lost on that tragic night and in honor of thousands of others, countless others, who were unnecessarily lost to this devastating illness to stop preventable deaths from sepsis once and for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Schumer. The gentleman with the pink tie, by the way, is from Brooklyn, living in, in Arizona, but he's originally from Brooklyn. He's a mixed marriage. His people are from Kerry. It's all right. Don't <laughs> Thank you very much. Tim Baker is here from Biomuro. Where is Tim Baker? Tim is a guy over in the corner who's worked very closely with us in the last year, putting this together and doing a lot of work. They are a sponsor here today. They've worked extremely hard. Tim has got 15 calls a day. He's returned 14. <laughs> yeah, they're also taking a video downstairs just asking people as they're leaving if you would cooperate, if you fancy it, that's, that's fine. Also, we are being streamlined across USA today. We know we're being watched across the country. We know we're being watched in Ireland and in England and throughout Europe. So the messages here today are going across. We're not, just, we're not just leaving it to any one person. We've sent it out, and they did that. Also not here today, phys physically, is our daughter Kathleen, is allegedly in school at the age of 12. And there are other children missing here today, siblings. And you got a day off school to come in, but Ken, well done. I know it's tough, because our daughter and the other families are going through what you're going. And you gave the best speech last night, by the way. Fair play to you. And they call you. Well done, Ken. <laughs> now, going forward, we have heard from the powers that be 
those who can do something and might do something, those who can do something and will do something. What we have done is going forward to, in the House, we've heard Congressman Crowley, so there will be a sepsis caucus set up in the House. Congressman Crowley is going to reach across the aisle. And we also have actually here today, Latasha Lee is here from Congressman Hastings' office in Florida. So some of the families are here from Florida. So we also will have one signed up. We will also be looking at the sepsis care legislation that Congressman Crowley is going to introduce. We are now working to find someone on the other side of the aisle to be a co-sponsor. We already, your congressman is a Republican. We have five Republican congressmen representing families here. We have been in touch with them. Most of you have made them. We are also looking at, obviously, what Senator Schumer has said. Senator Schumer is saying sepsis recognition every September is Sepsis Awareness Month. He's also said he's going to be sitting at the appropriations table. So people have to make sure when they're putting in for money what they're going to do with it and accountability. So we're moving on to that. This. We will also have, and it's not been announced, but I can tell you now, there will be hearings in the House next year on sepsis, full hearings on what's happening. So there'll be more members of Congress, including all of yours, sitting at those committees. So those are a couple of things we have in the works that's going to go forward. Um, we're also asking the Secretary of Health to appoint, nominate a, sepsis, a person that will absolutely be responsible for sepsis. We have an aid SAR who brought it down. We have various SARs, but we don't yet have one for sepsis. So we're going after that also. Those are the steps we're making. Is we also want more Roy's regulations in more states. We're going to meet with a few. We're not just going to take a shotgun approach. We're going to go. We're going to go right to the governor's office where we think we can do it. We're going to do more media stories. Tonight we're uh, it's supposed to be on CBS Evening News. We want to get more stories back in your states back in every state. Jim Dwyer is still hiding, but he's there someplace writing, and there's Irish media also going out there. And the thing we also have to do is to remember that 80% of patients that die with sepsis arrive at the hospital with sepsis. So there's no ambiguity or no anything anymore that there's maybe they picked it up in the hospital or maybe they didn't, or we're not really sure. I'll tell you what we're really sure of. All of our children that died walked into the hospital with sepsis. So if they check at the front door, they're going to save lives. And we know that. And there's no point dealing with sepsis in ICU. When our son went to ICU, as many of those was too late. As, as, as Dr. Dorfler, I believe, and I'll steal you for in, in a moment, is, it's almost like you're trying to save a burning building when the roof has thrown, fallen in. And if people think that's a standard we can live with, well, I hope it never happens to them or their children. Because what was inflicted upon us shouldn't be inflicted upon anyone. And it is now savable. So things must change. So to all of you here today, I want to congratulate you. Because I don't know if you've ever made history before. Some of you doctors probably have. At least you tell us you have. <laughs> right? But you've made history by coming here today. This is the first time in Capitol Hill, Washington, that there has been a sepsis forum. So give yourselves a good round of applause. Put it in your diaries for next year, because we'll be back again, and we'll have more results. So this is our call to action. No mass. No more children should be dying from sepsis. No more adults. No more people left coming out of the hospital losing many limbs. Thank you all very much. Lunch is over here, so we're not sending you home hungry. And please, 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 everyone who hasn't lost someone from sepsis, Count yourself lucky, and please try and prevent someone else from losing it. Dormila Mahagav Gilear. Thank you very much. Shalom. Hola. You're supposed to be over here speaking. You're supposed to speak.